Chapter 4, A Prepared Heart A prepared heart is ready for the worst sufferings. I am ready. This is Paul's claim. What a blessed frame of spirit. How hard, but how happy is it to get a heart so disposed and tempered. Every Christian can say, I want to be ready, Lord. May we be ready for sufferings. But few can say, I am ready. My heart is prepared and fitted for such a work. Yet Paul's example shows us that it is attainable. And the following particulars will abundantly convince us what a blessed thing it is to attain it. 1. Readiness for sufferings will bring the heart of a Christian to a holy rest and tranquility in a suffering hour, and prevent the anxiety and distraction of mind that puts a sinking weight into afflictions. The more cares, fears, and troubles we have before our sufferings come, the more calm, quiet, and composed we are likely to be when our sufferings have come indeed. It is admirable to consider with what peace and patience Job entertained his troubles, which concerning the kinds, degrees, and manner in which they came on him, one would think they should at least have startled and amazed him and put his soul, as gracious and humble as it was, into great disorder and confusion. But you find the contrary. Never did the patience of a man triumph at that rate over adversity. He worships God, acknowledges his hand, and resigns himself to his pleasure, Job 1, 20-21. Where did this come from? Surely had his troubles come by surprise, he could never have carried it at that rate. But in the days of its peace and prosperity, he had prepared for such a day as this. The thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come to me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet. Yet trouble came, Job three twenty-five and 26. He laid it to heart before it came. Therefore it neither distracted nor broke to heart when it came. In the same manner the prophet Habakkuk stood on his watchtower, that is, he made his observations on the events of providence through the word by which he got a clear vision of those troublesome days that were at hand. Though this foresight made him tremble in himself, it gave him rest in the day of evil, Habakkuk 3, verses 16 to 18. There is a twofold rest in the day of evil. There is a rest of deliverance and a rest of contentment. It is a singular mercy to find rest in one's own spirit, to enjoy inward peace and tranquility of mind when there is no rest without. The way to obtain this rest is to foresee, count on, and make adequate preparation for difficult times beforehand. Evils that come by way of surprise are not only overwhelming, but they are very frequently destructive evils. It is a sad aggravation to fill a misery before we fear it. Those calamities that find people feeling secure usually leave them desperate. The enemy that comes at us from our back has a great advantage to ruin us. Yet, this is a common case of the world. For man also knows not his time. It's the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and it's the birds that are caught in a snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falls suddenly upon them, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 12. This is how the old world perished. There was only one, Noah, who had provided for the flood, and he only with his family was preserved in it. All the rest were eating, drinking, marrying, and given in marriage until the flood came and swept them all away. Matthew 24, verse 38. Men will not use their power to look ahead. Because it is all quiet today, they conclude it will be so tomorrow. Those who are at rest in their dwelling and have a safe pillow under their heads are apt to fall asleep in security and dream pleasantly of continued rest and peace. They are loath to interrupt their sensual pleasure with melancholy thoughts of change and suffering. Philosophers tell us that immediately before an earthquake, the air is very quiet and serene. And before the great rain falls, the wind is usually still. Even if conditions and circumstances were even more favorable and encouraging than they are, 
tears still cause enough for all that are wise in heart to fear and tremble. Under the consideration of that national guilt, it is treasured up and will certainly produce distress and trouble. O Christians, look out for days of visitation. If you ever expect to find rest and peace in your own spirits, when the earth is full of violence, uproar, and desolation, prepare for a storm and make ready an ark, a hiding place in Christ and the promises. Number two. Our preparation for sufferings is an excellent argument of the honesty and sincerity of our hearts in the matters of religion. Those who expect sufferings and are daily at work with their own hearts to deaden their corruptions, wean their worldly affections, rouse and make ready their suffering graces, and resolve in the strength of God to take their lot with Christ, wherever and however it will fall or the people who have deliberately committed to Christ on his own terms and are likely to be durable and victorious Christians. As for hypocrites, Christ's summer friends, they have either their exception clauses against the severities of religion and plan to secure for themselves a retreat from danger, or their rush without consideration into the profession of Christ, never considering the terms that he proposes to all who will follow him. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me, Mark 8, verse 34. The necessity of a rational and well-advised agreement with Christ on sufferings and self-denying terms is by himself fully set out in that excellent parable in Luke 14, verses 25 to 28. There was a great multitude that followed him at that time. Christ's fame began to grow among them and they flocked from all parts to see and hear him. But he foresaw that if a sharp trial should fall on him, it would quickly thin and diminish that great multitude, and reduce them like Gideon's host into a little handful. Therefore he resolved to deal candidly and plainly with them. He proposed his terms and set down his conditions to which each one would follow him, must subscribe. The sum of it is this. Let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. To evince the rationality of these terms, he argues from the most common and obvious practices of men in their civil affairs. No man who exercises reason will begin to build a house and lay a large foundation when he is not provided a stock to build up the walls and complete the work. No man in his wits would engage with a handful of men against a great and armed multitude. Perhaps they may intend to face the enemy, but no man would think they intend to fight them with such a disadvantage. In just the same way stands a case in our profession of Christ. If we really intend to go through with the business of religion, we must sit down and compute the costs and charges of Christianity. We must think of the worst as well as the best. We must count on reproaches, prisons, and death for his sake, as well as the easier and more pleasant parts of active obedience. If we have done so, and if we can be content to run all the risks, and forego all the rest on his account, and manage ourselves accordingly in a day of suffering, then we deal with Christ and clear ourselves from the danger of hypocrisy. It is a lack of this that causes so many of those who profess Christ to faint and fall away in times of temptation, furnishing the devil with so many triumphs over religion and the more seemingly upright professors of it. It was a lack of depth of earth. That is a deep consideration and well-rooted resolution at first that the stony-grounded hypocrite so quickly withered away when the sun of persecution began to shine fervently on him. Matthew 13, verses 5 and 6 Without a doubt, God makes such deep wounds by conviction on people's hearts at first to prevent this fatal issue of our profession. It is for their establishment in future trials and sufferings that he so distresses and humbles them that he makes sin so bitter and burdensome to them. He knows that all this is necessary to prevent a return again to sin in the times of their temptation. 
if you have come to Christ in this way, and have in this way deliberately accepted his terms, if you have as well reflected on bearing his cross and wearing his crown, then you have a fair evidence of the uprightness of your heart. The world cannot provide a sweeter comfort. Number three, an advantage of preparations for sufferings is that it prevents and cuts off the scandal and offense of the cross with respect both to us and others. First, it prevents our own offense and stumbling because of sufferings. By Christ's own testimony, the soul is blessed that is not offended in him. Matthew 11, verse 6. Among the multitudes of those who profess Christ, Few were found who were not offended at suffering for Christ. They expected much peace, honor, and prosperity in the ways of religion. But finding their expectations frustrated and their earthly interest endangered, rather than secured by their profession of Christ, they go back, like those in John 6, verse 66, and walk no more with him. It is very remarkable that Christ dates the offense that men take at him from the first appearance of suffering. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. And then, shall many be offended, Matthew 24, verses 8 and 10. Sorrows and apostasies commence together. But, reader, if you are one who makes it your business to foresee and prepare for an evil day, you will have as good thoughts of Christ and his ways at the lowest ebb as ever you had in the great flourish and time of prosperity. Great peace of they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, verse 165. O happy soul, whom no troubles, reproaches, or sufferings are able to offend. You may meet with prisons, death, or banishments, but none of these things will offend or trip you. You will peaceably and safely pass over them, because they are no more than you expected and provided for. Second. Not only will you not stumble, but you also will prevent the offense and scandals of others and the ways of religion. It is a sad and dangerous thing to be an occasion of stumbling either to the weak or to the wicked. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be. The defenses will come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Matthew 18 verse 7 the apostasies and sinful compliances of ungrounded professing Christians and we Christians in times of temptation are the woeful occasions of prejudicing others against religion and shedding the blood of souls. It would be much better never to be in the practice of professing Christ than there to be only a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to others. But all this mischief will be prevented by your serious expectation and provision for the evil day. Number four. A fourth virtue of preparing for sufferings is that this preparation tends to convince and awaken the drowsy world. If the Lord's people would engage in this work in earnest, if they would live as people who are providing for a storm and resolve in the strength of God to run all risks and hardships for Christ, I am persuaded it would be of more use to startle and convince the world than all the sermons they ever heard. This unpreparedness is what dashes and cuts the throat of all our labors. We preach self-denial, contempt of life, and liberty for Christ. The hear is preach the necessity and excellency of these things, and you hear profess them as your principles. But when they look at the lives of professing Christians in times of danger and find no relation between profession and practice, when they see us cling to the world and are as loath to give it up as others, when they observe prisons and sufferings frighten and terrify us as much as those that make no profession, when they see us start like rabbits at every sound, and live not loose from the world as men prepare to let it go and give it up for Christ. Why, then they conclude that we dare not trust our own principles when it comes to the push. And how can they be persuaded to believe that, which they think we ourselves do not really believe, although we persuade them to believe it? My friends, the world has eyes to see what you do, 
as well as ears to hear what you say, and as long as they say you do no more than others, you may talk your hearts out, for they will believe your way is better than others. But now when persecution arises, did they see you prepare yourselves for it? Did they see you put on your armor to engage in the conflict? Did they see you carry your dearest comforts loosely in your hands and put on the shoes of preparation to follow the Lord through the roughest ways of sufferings? This had convinced to propose and preach the excellency of Christ, the vanity of the creature, and the rationality and certainty of Christian principles and a more intelligible and rousing dialect to them than all our cheap and easy commendations of them did. This is how it is said that Noah condemned the world by faith. Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Hebrews 11 verse 7. Noah had been warned of the deluge that was coming, and even though there was no appearance of it yet, the heavens being as clear as ever, he believed and moved with fear. The fear of God and effect of his faith and the word of God moved and impelled him to his duty. It set him about his preparation work to provide an ark. And by this he condemned the world and left them without excuse. For they not only heard by his ministry of an approaching flood, but they now saw that he himself believed what he preached by his daily preparations for it. Consider this. How much would it tend to the world's conviction if they saw that you were sincere and that there is a reality in godliness? This will undo them to search into the manner more than ever and remove those prejudices that would have taken up against the good ways of God as if they were but fantasies and imaginations. Next. This foresight and preparation is an excellent thing because the Spirit of God everywhere sets an honorable character on it and always mentions persons who prepare with exceptional accommodation and respect in the judgment of God. These were the wise men and all the rest, no matter how great they are famed to be among men, are counted as fools. The wise man's eyes are in his head. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 14, that is, he sees ahead, but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22 verse 3, they rush on, without consideration, suspect no danger that they do not see right now, and then are punished for their foolishness. Beloved, there are signs of the times as well as of the weather. Matthew 16 verse 3, you may see the clouds of judgment gathering before the storm falls on you. This is the meaning of Zephaniah 2, 1 and 2. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the days pass as a chaff. When there is a conception of judgment, there will be a birth unless the reformations and prayers of the saints cause it to miscarry. But it requires wisdom to discern this. You must observe carefully to discern and discover it at a great distance. But this can be done by considering what God has done in similar cases and in former times when nations have been guilty of the same sins as they are now. For God is as just now as he was then, and hates sin as much as he ever did. And by partly p paying attention to the present things, to what fullness and maturity are the sins of a nation grown? Joel 3. Or what beginnings of judgment are already on a people as harbingers and forerunners of more at hand? Luke 23, 30 and 31. 1 Samuel 2, verse 12. Or what is the universal note and cry of God's ministers? His watchmen to foresee danger. Ezekiel 3, verse 17 and his trumpeters to discover it. Numbers 10 verse 8. When these all speak with one mouth, certainly there is much in it. Luke 1 verse 70. Lastly, discernment can come from pondering those scripture prophecies that yet remain to be fulfilled, 
they must go all out at their times and accomplish their full numbers of years and months. But certainly, they will be fulfilled in their seasons. By paying attention to these things, a Christian may give a near guess at the judgments that are approaching a nation, and so order himself accordingly. A wise man heart discerns both time and judgment. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 5 And this is even in the judgment of God a choice point of wisdom. On the contrary, heedless and careless ones that do not regard these things are branded for fools and upbraided with more brutishness than the beasts of the field or fowls of the air. Matthew 16 verse 3 The stork in the heaven knows her appointed times and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. Jeremiah 8, verse 7. The swallow, turtle, and crane observe their seasons of departing and returning at the approach of winter and spring. They do this by a natural instinct by which they prolong their lives, or else they would perish. But though God has made man wiser than the fowls of the air and the beasts of the earth, which by instinct will leave colder climates, or run to the hedges when winter or storms approach. The heavens may still be astonished to see nature cast by sin so far below itself, and in creatures of reason. But, if this is foreseen, we do have a remarkable advantage in our hands. We can either use a means of preventing those approaching calamities, Zephaniah 2 verse 3, or if they cannot be prevented, we can take sanctuary in Christ, Micah 5, verse 5, and run to the promises and attributes, Isaiah 26, 20, and 21, and so have a good roof over our heads while the storm falls and the weather is tempestuous outside. Certainly this preparation is an excellent thing. Whatever the Spirit of God speaks in the combination of foreseen evils, is with respect to this duty of preparing for them. For foresight of evils without preparation increases, rather than diminishes the misery of them. A sixth merit of preparation lies in the influence it has on Christ's stability in evil day. You must know that your stability in that critical hour of temptation is a choice, an extraordinary mercy considering that all you are worth in the other world depends on your standing then. Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8. Romans 2, verses 6 and 7. Luke 22, verses 27 and 28. You must also know how much you are likely to be tried and pressed. You have been so often foiled in lesser trials. Jeremiah 12, verse 5. Whether you respect the enemy that engages you, Ephesians 6, verse 12 or your own weakness. All the grace you have will be just enough to hold your position and keep you from sinking. Therefore, it can only be a blessed thing to be able to stand and cope with the greatest difficulties in such a time of trial as that will be. Now, if you expect to do this, you must put on the whole armor of God. There is no expectation of standing an evil day unless your feet are shod. That is, your wills prepared with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6, 12-14 It is true that our ability to stand is not from our own inherent grace. For by strength shall no man prevail, 1 Samuel 2, verse 9. Yet it is also true that without grace, both inherent in us and excited and prepared for a storm, we cannot expect to stand. For these two grace inherent in us and grace exciting and assisting outside us are not opposed, but coordinated. Grace in us is a weapon by which our enemy falls, but that weapon must be managed by the hand of the Spirit. Look on this as a choice mercy that tends so much to your stability. Number seven, excellency of a prepared heart is that it is very strong testimony of our love for Jesus Christ. When we show our willingness to cast our lot with him and follow him wherever he goes. Such a high profession of love Ruth gave to her mother Naomi. I will not go back, but where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, 
I will lodge. Ruth 1 verse 16. It is excellent when a soul can say to Christ, as Zatias said to David, Surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will your servant be. Second Samuel 15 verse 21. This is love indeed, to cling to him in a time of such distress and danger. This is love that many waters cannot quench, nor floods drown. Song of Solomon 8 verse 7. If you truly love Christ, show your love by some fruits of it. This certainly is a very choice fruit and proof of it. Many profess a great deal of love for Christ. But when it comes to this test, the love appears false and counterfeit. Just a mere show when no danger is near. But the soul that buckles on the shoes of preparation to follow him through thorns and briars and over the rocks and mounts of difficulties and troubles loves him indeed, Jeremiah 2, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, it is one of the choicest displays of your love to your master Christ. Even angels are not capable of making such a testimony of love to him. They show their love by their readiness to do his will. It flies with wings in the execution of it. Ezekiel 1 verse 24 You only have the happiness of evidence in your love by your readiness to suffer for him. Is that not excellent? Number 8. When your heart is prepared for the worst sufferings, it is an argument that your will is subdued to the will of God. For until this is done in good measure, you cannot stand ready to suffer for him. But now to have your will subdued by grace to the will of God is a very choice and excellent state indeed. For in this, the main power of grace lies. Where the chief residence and strength of sin was, the power of grace after conversion is now in the same chief residence before conversion. It is the will that the strength and the power of sin lay. John 5, 40, Psalm 81, verse 11, Jeremiah 44, verses 16 and 17. Indeed, it was the devil's stronghold, but in the day of Christ's power, he storms and reduces it to his obedience. Psalm 110, verse 3. But what a blessed thing this is. The will rules the man. It has the empire of the whole man. It commands the faculties of the soul. And it commands the members of the body. Now to have Christ and grace rule that which rules and commands your inner and outer man is no small mercy. There is no better evidence than that you stand ready or seriously prepare yourselves to suffer the heart of things for Christ. If your will can be pleased with that work, it is an argument that grace has conquered and subdued your will indeed. 9. Preparation of your heart to suffer is an excellent thing, because God is so abundantly pleased with it that he often excuses him from sufferings in whom he finds it and accepts it as if the service had been actually done. Abraham was ready to offer up his Isaac's life to God. But God, seeing a servant's heart really prepared and ready for that difficult service and higher point of self-denial, provided himself another sacrifice instead of Isaac. Abraham will have his son Isaac back again, and with this advantage, for he has with him not only a choice test of his love for God, but God's high approval of him and acceptance of his offering. In respect of divine acceptance, it was as if Isaac had been slain. Scripture represents it this way. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? James 2 verse 21. And in this sense, that promise is often made good to God's people who stand ready to give up their Isaacs, their lives, liberties, and dearest pleasures to the Lord. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Luke 9, verse 24. Well, a blessed thing is this. In this way you may have the crown of martyrdom, but not actually shed one drop of blood for Christ. How kindly God accepts it at his poor creature's hands when he sees how willing they are to serve him with their best treasures. He said to David, 
Thou didst well that it was in your heart, First Kings 8.18. And last, for Christians to prepare their hearts for suffering is beyond controversy, an excellent and blessed thing, because should such Christians, after all their pains and preparations, be overcome and fall by temptation, dispreparation of their hearts excuses their fall from those aggravations that are on the falls of others and will give them both support in their condition and encouragement to hope for a speedy recovery out of it. It is a great comfort when a poor soul that has been overcome by temptation can come to God and say, Lord, you know that this was not a willful departure from my duty, but it was contrary to the bent and resolutions of my heart. You saw my diligence beforehand to prepare for it, and you saw my fears and trembling of heart about it, O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, restore your servant. Wash away this spot. It is one of the spots of your children. It is an infirmity, not a rebellion. This may greatly steal the soul. Certainly in this case you have many grounds of comfort that others do not have, since your sin is but an infirmity. First, it is a sin that is common to all of the saints, Psalm 103, verses 11 and 14. Second, God has mercy and pardon for sins such as these. Otherwise, woe to the holiest soul. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. On this ground, Hezekiah pleads for mercy for those who prepared their hearts. Second Chronicle 30, verses 18 and 19. And God has given sweet grounds of encouragement for such souls. Numbers 15, verses 27 and 28. Hebrews 5, verse 2. How tenderly Christ deals with his disciples. Under this kind of sin, Matthew 26, verse 41. Though they deserted him for a time, he did receive them again. Though they fled from him, they all returned and afterward appeared boldly for Christ and sealed their confession of him with their blood. That which restored them was this. Their fall and departure were contrary to the resolution, normal structure and inclination of their hearts, for they had all resolved to cleave to him to the death. Matthew 26, verse 35. Those who had professed Christ without considering the cost and never resolved or prepared for the worst fell away from him and never returned again. John 6, verse 66. So then on the whole, you cannot help but admit that it is a very blessed and excellent thing to prepare for the greatest suffering that can fall on us for Christ.